Last Sunday, Sri Krishna was speaking about the three gunas and how to go beyond the three gunas. The whole universe is interpenetrated by these three forces, Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. They are there in us also and they produce various states of mind by their presence in man in a very big way. If sattva predominates, certain behavior and certain state of mind. If rajas predominates, something else. If tamas predominates, something else. Knowing this, we have to manipulate our own inner life to see that we have less and less of tamas, less and less of rajas, more of sattva. That is a great state in itself. But the higher state takes us even beyond sattva. The Atman is not subject to any gunas. When you realize the Atman, you go beyond the gunas. So that concept has been introduced in the second chapter of the Gita, and now it is being discussed in a bigger way. Triguna Atita. Atita means above, transcendental. Of Triguna, three guna. You transcend the three gunas. Ramakrishna's parable I recited last Sunday that Sattva also is a thief, but a kind hearted thief, a robber. Rajas is also a thief, but a little more rough. Thomas is a very bad thief, will rob you, kill you, all sorts of things he will do. So this story of Ramakrishna gives us the relative values of these three functioning in a human system. A Thomasic type of person, Ramakrishna says, if a thief enters and takes a few things from the house and he is caught by the owner. That man will give a good beating to him and finally take him to the police and so that he may be put in prison. He is beaten enough, why carry to the police station again? That's called his Rajasik. He has no compassion. So you can see Thomasic, Rajasic type behaving in the human situation and the sattvic type behaving in the human situation. In fact, in all civilized societies, more of sattvic types are present. Even a criminal we have to treat with some respect, especially when he is not convicted. When you, I told the police when I was speaking to them, when you catch a criminal or alleged criminal, and ask him to get into the van, police van, you can tell it in a nice way, please get into this police van. But we don't know that. We just kick him into the police van with all the roughness. But why? What is the necessity? His punishment comes later. Where do you punish here? Respect him. He is a citizen of your own country. Now in these matters, human behavior has to undergo a big change before we can become truly civilized. We are very rough in dealing with other human beings. A little element of sattva must come into our life. This when the people think about it, they get the impulse to change from tamas to rajas, rajas to sattva. That's the importance of this science of the three gunas. They are there in animals, in cosmic areas as well as in human beings. They, are, they interpenetrate the whole of nature. Nature itself is composed of the three gunas, sattva, rajas and tamas. And so coming to this type of discussion about the three gunas, we find Arjuna asking this question, what is the nature of a man? 
who have gone beyond the three gunas. We see people with all the gunas, various types are there. If there is a type which is beyond the three gunas, I would like to know how does he behave, how to understand him, etc., etc. And I said, this kind of question had come in the second chapter towards the end, when he spoke of buddhi, steady buddhi, sthita pratnya. He said, what is the nature of a sthita pratnya? We don't find sthita pratnyas everywhere. Mind is shaken by every experience. This is a man who is not shaken by any experience, absolutely steady. What is the nature of that person? The last few verses of the second chapter were devoted to describing the nature of a sthita pratnya. Sthita means steady. Pratnya means mind or wisdom. A steady wisdom. Then this Triguna idea came later on here and there. Now this chapter is entirely devoted to the three gunas. And the last part of it says, what is the nature of one who has gone beyond the three gunas? Sri Ramakrishna refers to this in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. You will find children up to the age of five, they are beyond the three gunas. That is Ramakrishna said. These gunas begin to operate only they are after five years. They are spontaneous. They are absolutely living a free life. That is the nature of little children. So in India the Paramahamsas, those who go beyond the three gunas, those who go beyond even the mind, highly spiritual, they are compared to children of five years old. These children are absolutely pure. They do not know how to be clever, how to hide and all that. They are just open, like that. I remember one story during the evacuation, during partition of India. One child saw his father a little frightened when he got into a ship in Karachi, which I had arranged for him to migrate to India. He was an engineer. And when some Pakistani volunteers came nearby, naturally father became a little worried. What will happen? They may take me out. He is an engineer of the state. I told him, don't migrate till I tell you. When things are very bad, I will arrange for your migration. So at this time, he became slightly worried. And this boy saw him, father, oh, you have been bunking. How did you do that? The child is asking straight away. Huh? You got frightened? Like that. That father told me this story. That is your children. Absolutely straightforward. No chalaki. Nothing is there. This is the nature of little children. They are like the sages. Absolutely. And sages like to keep children with them. Because they are absolutely pure. They are beyond the three gunas, etc. That is Sri Ramakrishna's example given in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. Here, Arjuna asked this question. Kair linga yihi, trin guna netan, atito bhavati prabho, timachara katham chetam, trin guna ativartate. Kair linga yihi, by what indications? Says, trin guna netan, atito bhavati prabho. By what indications can we understand? that a person has gone beyond the three gunas. Timachara katham chaitan three gunan adivartate Those who go beyond the three gunas, how do they function? How do they behave? Their contact and behavior from externally, how can we understand them? This much is the question. And Sri Bhagavan Vacha Sri Krishna replied, Prakasham cha pravartim cha mohameva cha pandava nadveshti samparvartani na nivartani kamshati Three things associated with the three gunas. We have studied earlier verses. One is called prakasham, illumining attitude, light inside. The sattva produces a light inside. Luminous mind, 
และที่สัตว์สกุลประกาศเอฟเฟกต์ออฟสัตว์ปรับปรุงที่อินเทนซ์แอคทิวิตี้รันนิ่งอบูดูอินดิสเซนเดตดัสกอลเรจิสต์เฟรุตเรจิสและที่สองคือโมฮะเดลิวชันเฟรุตฟตามัสทั้งสองประกาศเองเชื่อปรับปรุงเองเชื่อโมฮะเมย์เบชะปานเดวะนัดเวสตีสัมปรับปรุงตานี This man who is beyond the three gunas will not be unhappy when all these three are present within, near him or within him. Nor is he going to be worried if they do not come also. They are, he has gone beyond them. They can come and go, never touch them at all. That is the language. If you are well dressed in a winter, any amount of winter can be there. You have dressed very well. You have no fear. But if you are lightly dressed, you will be in trouble. So when you are well strengthened by your spiritual realization, you have gone beyond the gunas. Let the gunas come, let them go. What does it matter to me? That is why you have gone beyond prakriti. This prakriti functioning in your body and mind, you have gone beyond it. The atman is beyond the prakriti. Therefore, you have established in the atman. These things do not give you. Any trouble, their presence or absence, do not make any difference to him. That is the first characteristic. Not dwesti, some pravarta ani. When they are active in you, you don't get upset. Dwesha means anger. You don't get angry or upset. None of that ani. He says, "Come, shut it. You have gone away. Oh, I should like to have them. I should like to have them. That doesn't come. You are indifferent because you are beyond it. Doesn't matter." Just like we were telling the story of a mosquito sitting on a baby and sitting on a bull. When it sits on a baby, it troubles the baby. You have to drive it away. So a mosquito sat on the horn of a bull. After some time, he felt, "Why should I trouble this bull? Bull, bull, let me go away, Mr. Bull. I am going away." I'm not going to trouble you. Bull said, "No, please continue to sit as long as you like. It doesn't trouble me at all. That is a state of strength. When we realize the Atman, this coming and going of gunas will not make any difference to you. This is what thinking about. A little bit of it, if we can get, how beautiful life can be. A little inner strength coming from our spiritual nature." That is what this sloka recommends to you. Then, second sloka says, "This is verse 22." And then next he says, "Udasi na vadasi no, guna idyo na vichalyate, guna vartanta ittyeva, yo avadhisthandi na ingate." He is absolutely udasi. He sits indifferent to all these coming and going. These are all actual possibilities for every human being. A little training, a little attention in that direction. Take, for example, when we are young, somebody abuses you, you get terribly upset. You react very strongly. But the same person, when he becomes old enough, somebody abuses, he doesn't react in the same way because he has attained some knowledge of experience of life. Oh, it doesn't matter. They say like that. Let it go. But when we are young, we are very much in the body. We don't like any one of these remarks. So we get reaction very strongly at that time. So these things you can see actually happening. What is serious at one time is not serious at another time. Some new value has entered into the human system. You can go beyond. You can go beyond these ups and downs. That is the disease. Udasi na bat, asi no. Remaining indifferent. People are shouting at him, uh, criticizing him. He doesn't mind. Absolutely, quite correct. You go on. I will also enjoy it like that. Ramakrishna said, a person abuses you. You just hear what he says and try to clear out what these words mean. Convert them into letters, sounds, etc. Nothing more. Combination of so many letters and sounds that is all, nothing else. This kind of capacity to react to such situation is a spiritual capacity. 
everybody can develop it or we can be also extremely sensitive If somebody scolded me i went and committed suicide that also i can do very very sensitive no spiritual strength at all now i was in mysore in 2020s every time the examination results are announced some child or the other will go and die in the coconut leaf tank there were tank in mysore because he has he found his name is not found in the list that means he has failed he doesn't go home even straight goes to the tank dies away what does it show very weak mind there is no strength to stand one mishap in life what is this that's a normal custom then they put guards during the examination to the time they all day but i meant to say that there are levels of strength we need a little more strength the only message of vedanta is be strong be fearless there are many things to frighten you but there is a profound dimension within you if you can manifest a bit of it you become fearless you can stand the nonsense of life that is what vedanta wants to make of humanity be strong be fearless there are causes to fear but we can rise above them by understanding our true nature this is why he said udasina vadasina gunai riyo na vichalyate he is never shaken by the operation of these three gunas vichalyate vichalna means shaking guna guneshu vartante guna vartanta ityeva all these movements of the world around so all operations of the three gunas gunas acting on gunas run the universe why should i worry about it guna vartanta ityeva yo avadhishtanti those who stay quietly with this conviction na ingate they are not disturbed they are not shaken at all that is a type of achievement which is very much needed in human life that's why character strength also means the same thing we are not petty small thing what you call we are not mimosa pudika that little plant if you do blow your air on it it becomes like the half dead gone after some time it comes to life we are not mimosa pudika we have got some strength within it that's a wonderful idea then samadukha sukha sastha samalavashta ashma kanchana tulle praya tulle priya priyo dhira tulle ninda atma samstuti hi re samadukha sukha mind is even equal minded in happiness and misery samadukha sukha that is a constant teaching in the gita samatvam that mind becomes sama a constant steady mind a little up and down you think quickly it becomes steady you cannot become upset for long samadukha sukha this is very important characteristic in the spiritual life we have to start with this samatva so gita defines yoga as samatvam samatvam yoga uchyate you are able to keep your mind in a steady condition nothing can shake it up and down either dukha or sukha that is a wonderful quality as i often describe it in modern neurological terms that nature has achieved for you a samatva in your body there is a constancy in your body temperature is constant blood constituents are constant you work they change and it is report return back to the original state body has a built in mechanism homeostatic mechanism as they call it body has got it who got it for you nature nature has done it for you now you do for yourself this higher level of homeostasis the mind is steady it is built in mechanism to make it equilibrium that is your responsibility shama and dama two great words in sanskrit control the mind control of the sensory energy system if you have this you have that kind of samatva within your system without this samatva no higher life is possible this is a dictate of neurology in fact that book on neurology the living brain by the gray walter he quotes the great teacher sir joseph barcroft of cambridge university who was his teacher 
Who said, a, what you call, equanimous context is essential for the free life. That's the language. Without that equanimity within, free life cannot be, higher life cannot be. The highly choppy wave system in Atlantic, when you take your boat across, cannot create ripples. Ripples would be only in a calm lake. Those ripple systems are very important in all scientific thought. So ripple system is produced only when the lake is calm and your boat goes in that calm lake. So when the mind is calm, great things come, great new developments come. So this is a very important statement in neurology. So here also, Krishna says here, Samadukha Sukha Swasthaha. Swastha means steady, living in yourself, not shaken out of yourself. Swastha, huh? be established in yourself. Swastha. Samalavastha Asma Kanchanaha. The mind has an equal reaction to Lavastha Asma Kanchana. Maybe a stone or a piece, a little bit of uh, earth as well as gold. In all these things, mind doesn't make much distinction. He has developed that equanimous attitude. Sama Lavastha Asma Kanchanaha. A clod of earth, a stone and gold. Yeah, what are they? They are the same material. Basically, they are the same. That knowledge comes. Therefore, he can stand free and he can keep the mind above their temptations. Tulya Priya Priyo, equal minded when things pleasant happens to you or unpleasant happens to you. Priya and Apriya. Tulya Ha. Dhiraha. Courageous man, heroic mind. Dhiraha. Tulya Ninda Atma Samstuti. The mind is even when some people abuse him or some people praise him. His mind is even at the same time. In fact, according to our political philosophy, given in the Mahabharata and other books, all rulers and administrators must possess some of these qualities. If there's somebody praises, they lose their head. Somebody condemns, again they lose their head. Such people cannot be good administrators or good rulers. That's it. So an average person must develop a measure of this equality of vision, equal mindedness, samadrishti, samatva. Tulya priya priyo dhira tulya vinda atma samstuti. Then, mana apamana yoho. Mana apamana. It is honor and dishonor. Tulya ha. There also the mind is steady. Tulyo mitrari patrayoho. Also, in dealing with friend and enemy, we don't have any attachment. We keep the mind even there. Mitrari pakshayoha. Sarva arambha parityagi. This kind of initiation of projects all the time, feverish mind, initiating so many projects all the time, he has given up that. His mind is steady, whatever thing comes to be done, he does it. Does it very well. You say, Yada yat kurute karma tadadat anukishthate. In the Ashtavakra Samhita, it is said, a perfect man will simply do things as they come. He doesn't run after things, run after doing things. Whatever comes, he does very well. Because he doesn't need anything much more than what he actually needs to preserve his body. Sarvarambha Parityagi Gunatita Savuchyate Such persons are known as Gunatita Beyond the three gunas These external world pressures do not condition them They have become unconditioned by all this They have become free That is the goal of human life This human being shaken by nature and its forces all the time slowly develops a certain strength to resist all this, then develop an equanimous mind, then goes beyond all of them. That's called Gunati Itaha. Everybody has the possibility of becoming Gunati Itaha. But it is a very 
long, long struggle. But it is good to begin that struggle, gain at least 5% or 10% of this great capacity. Then verse 26 says, Mamchayo Adhivicharena Bhakti Yogena Sevate Sagunan Samati Tietan Brahma Bhuyaya Kalpate. Ultimately, turn your attention to me, the one self in all of you, Krishna says, as the Antadhyamin. In yourself of all. Say, Yo Mamcha, Abhivicharena, Bhakti Yogena Sevate. Those who serve me through the Yoga of Bhakti, straight, un, what you call disturbed, that kind of Bhakti, steady Bhakti, those who worship me, Sagunan Samati Tietan. He transcends all these Gunas. Brahma Bhuyaya Kalpate become fit to be one with Brahman, that ultimate reality. Krishna's bhakti comes in here. Ramakrishna said, without bhakti, you can try to control your mind, control these various gunas within you, you find it difficult. But if there is love for God, it becomes much easier. Love can make many things easier, especially directed to the divine. So Bhakta has got greater facility to control the mind and go beyond all this than a non-Bhakta. So he said, Mantayo Abhivicharena, Unshaken Bhakti, that's Abhivicharena Bhakti, Vedanta Bhakti, One-Pointed Bhakti, Bhakti Yogena Sevate, those who worship me, serve me, those who serve me, Sa Gunan Samati Itya Etan, He Transcends, he or she transcends all these gunas. Brahma Bhuyaya Kalpate becomes fit for achieving oneness with Brahman. Then he says, Brahmano hi Pratishtaham. I am the very basis or support of even Brahman. Brahmano hi Pratishtaham. Amrutasya Aviyasya immortal, the imperishable of that Brahman and the person behind doing everything. So Brahmana Pratishtha. In the next chapter we shall be dealing with Purushottama, Purushottama Yoga. The Uttama Purusha. I am called Uttama Purusha. Supremely divine person. There were Bhakti is directed to that divine person. So he says this Krishna as the divine incarnation, the self in all, Brahmano hi Pratishtaham, and also the Pratishta of also Brahman, which is immortal and infinite. Shashutasya ke dharmasya, also of eternal dharma, which protects this universe. Sukasya egantikasya cha, and also of infinite happiness, one pointed happy life. I am also the basis of all this. I am the abode of Brahman. That is the language first. Brahmano hi Pratishtaham. The immortal, the immutable of everlasting dharma and of absolute bliss. That is where when we turn our attention to this, we get the highest. Brahman has two dimensions, what we call two aspects, Nirguna and Saguna. With form, without form. With qualities, without qualities. Brahman and Shakti, that's called Shakti, the power of Brahman. Brahman and the power are non-different. They are the same. Just like Ramakrishna calls a snake coiled up is the Nirguna Brahman. The same snake in movement is called Saguna Brahman. The same snake. When it becomes the universe, it is called Saguna. When it is beyond this name and form, it is Nirguna. It is this wonderful Brahman that comes through Shakti as an incarnation of the Divine. He can say, I am one with the highest. He has every right to say so, because he is like that. He is not physically conditioned. Though as a human being, he behaves like all of us. This was subject, a study, in the fourth chapter of this Gita, 
the nature of an incarnation, how difficult to discover his infinite dimension, we see only that finite dimension. The highest is manifesting through that particular person. And so the chapter ends with the statement, Brahmano hi pratishtaham as a Purushottama, I am the, the Uttama Purusha. There you go. Avrasya, Amatasya, Adhyasya, mortality and infinitude. Similarly, Shashutasya, Dharmasya, of the eternal Dharma, which sustains this universe, we call in India our religion as eternal Dharma. Sanatana Dharma. It has no name, it has no location. It is Sanatana Dharma. It cuts through all the various religions of the world. Sanatana Dharma you can see in every religion. Here it is Sanatana Dharma. Other things, rules and regulations are called Yuga Dharma. A Dharma for a particular people, particular age, how to dress, how to eat, how to perform marriages. All these are called Yuga Dharma or Smriti. This is called Shruti, eternal Dharma, dealing with eternal verities which are true, which you can test and verify. So the other is personal preference. This is truth as it is. These are two different things. What you call Matam and Tattvam. Matam is personal preference. I like this food. I like this way of dressing. It's up to you. You are absolutely free. You can change it also. Therefore it is called Matam. The other is you have to conform to it. It is the truth. You have to realize it for yourself. That is why it is called Tattvam. 2 plus 2. 2 plus 2 is 4. It is Tattvam. You can't alter it. But in other cases, you can alter many things. So, we made a distinction between Matam and Tattvam. Matam is always plural. Tattvam is always singular. There is only one Tattvam. Fire is hot. It is a Tattvam. You can't change it. That is in physical life. Similarly, the infinite Atman, ever pure, ever free, that is our true nature. That is the Tattum about man. The other is all Matam about human being. We are weak, we are small, we are this, we are black and white. These are all Matam. That is Tattum. That Tattum we have to realize. So Tattu Darshi, we call it. One who realizes this truth is called Tattu Darshi. That is why when Vivekananda was speaking in America, during question time, somebody put this question. Are you not preaching Swami some sort of hypnotism? He asked this question. Straight came the answer. No, I am dehypnotizing you. You are already hypnotized. I am black, I am white, I am this, I am that. You are not. You are that eternal reality, the Atman. That is your true nature. So our work is to dehypnotize you. That is true religion. And so, here also, the same. Every one of us has a lot of hypnotic influences on us. That is what makes us come to quarrel and fight. A little search for the tattvam, a little scientific mind, scientific use in the widest sense, search for truth, search for truth. That is science. What is the truth of the thing? We simply say, oh, I believe it's so and so. But belief you can have any number. Is the belief true? You must ask that question. That's where you come to science. That is Vedanta. We deal with Tattvam. Tattva Shastram, it means that. So we made a distinction. Therefore, we allowed changes in the Smriti, in the Yuga Dharma. We are changing, changing, changing. But Shruti is eternal, steady. That's called Sanatana Dharma, comes from the Shruti, nature of the Atman, nature of interhuman relations, nature of the Supreme Reality. These are all Shruti. These are all tattvam. You have to accept them and test them and verify them for yourself. But a smriti teaching cannot be verified. You only to obey. You only to believe. This way you must put your shirt. You must put a shikha in your head. Such a smriti we had there. Now we have given up all that. All that putting a shikha etc. But Sanatana Dharma doesn't go when you cut off your shikha. You can cut off any number of shikhas. Sanatana Dharma will not die. Because it is based on something else. One grandfather went to fast when his grandchild cut off his shikha one day in Mysore, 60 years ago. 
we have to persuade him don't do so these are all changing times somebody likes to keep it somebody likes to throw it there is enough provision in our shastras against all these things this is only smriti but not shruti so a little bit persuasion he gave up the fasting we have passed through all the stage but this understanding has kept us steady shruti and smriti smritis are multiple and many how many smritis we have and now all the smritis have gone we have got our into code bill and a constitution that is the smriti by which we live we can't break any rule of this constitution but the shruti is eternal upanishads they are called shruti there is no second set of upanishads only upanishads that's all because they deal with eternal verities that is called sanatana dharma so here he calls it here he says sugasya here shashuta sita dharma stya the shashuta dharma eternal dharma any amount of changes will take place at the peripheral area of life the central area everything remains the same the one remains the many change and pass shelley's beautiful poem the one remains many change and pass when you deal with the many you are dealing with smriti similarly when you deal with the one we are dealing with the shruti aspect of truth so this is how the chapter 14 has been concluded with this statement how to go beyond the three gunas is good to try so that at least we can lift from life from tamas to rajas that itself is a great achievement lazy absolutely no interest in anything but interested in troubling people all such thing also can remain with tamas that you come to rajas beautiful development but when you go to sattva the best development happy human relations not fighting quarreling litigation all this will be very much less our politics just now is a little sattva has come to it till now it was all rajas and tamas all these two months now a little sattva has come when the opposition leader can come to the uh, uh, what you call the the um, presentation of uh, the prime minister's uh, status to a newly elected prime minister it was never happening some time ago it is a beautiful beginning this kind of thing so you can see the political life of a nation can be either tamasic or rajasic or mixed with both or a little sattvic when it becomes sattvic then its intense activities will not create fire and tension and suffering only peaceful activities will be there it is good for our people to know that these are the possibilities when we know it we will certainly try to raise our activities beyond the rajas to a little bit of sattva that kind of politics is truly democratic democracy can thrive only under such conditions under other conditions it will be up and down today it is nice tomorrow it goes wrong and we don't want that kind of up and down in our democratic experiment having finished a chapter on the three gunas 14 chapter we enter the next chapter 15 chapter it is a very important chapter we begin with taking a look at this whole universe through an imagery imagery of a tree imagine the whole world is a mighty tree the tree is a very important element in indian culture so krishna begins his discourse on the 15th chapter in the 15th chapter with this statement urdha mulo asa shaka esho ashwatha ashwatham rahur adhyayam this teaching that the world is like a tree but a unique type of tree roots above branches below so one tree doesn't do so the other tree does it so both are there holy trees in our tradition the papal tree as well as ashwatha tree or vata vata is the actual meaning here so 
this whole universe is like a ashwatthaya tree how roots above branches below what a nice picture what an amount of thinking has gone behind to produce such an imagery high class poetry we can say bhurbhamulo athashyaka ashwatham rahur adyayam and this ashwatthaya tree is adyayam imperishable is always there but constantly changing and yet it is there prahur adyam chandamsi yasya parnani yastam vedasa vedavi the leaves of this tree are the vedic words vedic utterances they are the thing that protects the tree therefore they are called chandamsi the utterance of the vedas veda means knowledge and then yastam veda sa vedavi those who know this truth they understand the vedas this is a wonderful truth about this universe so sandarg veda up to this gita this concept of the tree as a symbol of existence symbol of existence the tree of existence as we call it that has been there with some modifications here and there we find the trees have played a great part in our culture and history and primitive man living in the midst of trees made the trees something very sacred they are also the place of their gods in all primitive societies you will find respect for trees in our vedic civilization they lived among the trees their education in the midst of forest so that forest had a great place in our cultural heritage and so we selected some trees in the forest for special attention those are this ashwatthaya or vata and the other is the pippala or vata is also called that nyagrodha growing downward nyak means down grodha nyagrodha these are the words now these are highly holy trees in our whole tradition we go around the tree at one time many of our people used to go and worship the trees on which yakshas and yakshis used to live yaksha worship was common during buddha's time out of this they developed a philosophy we did not leave it at that stage they applied the great vedantic thought to these great experiences of the people and produced a remarkable philosophy out of it so this tree is what is holy to us later on it became still more holy when buddha sat under the bodhi tree and attained illumination from that time this bodhi vriksha kalpa dhruma as they call it this became very very holy all over india and in this tree there is sacredness because buddha became enlightened under that tree so trees played a great part in our thinking there are many other references in the vedas and in the mahabharata of how the trees became the abode of god the abode of gods etc etc that is called the sacredness of the tree in indian tradition but also other parts of the world trees are highly sacred as i said in all primitive communities trees are very sacred it is only in the semitic religious communities you don't find much sacredness given to trees only sacredness is only for the god that's all that one god that alone is sacred none of these but in all primitive societies and in india trees play a great part first of all they are very helpful to man secondly they are the boats of their gods thirdly you sit under a tree you get illumination means that tree has got a great value in this way trees became very sacred in india in europe in scandinavia tree has got very high status especially one tree they call it yggdrasil the ash tree that is considered to be very sacred in scandinavian mythology 
and Carlyle has written a very beautiful paragraph about the nature of that Yggdrasil or the ash tree. But the difference between Indian tree and the Scandinavian tree is its roots are below like any other tree. But in India they put its root above because philosophy came to handle this subject of the holiness of a tree and philosophy found from the cause the effect has come. The effect is visible, the cause is not visible and therefore in that invisible world beyond time and space is the root of this tree and into time and space that root grows into a mighty tree so downward, nyak downward, that is how this tree has come. This is called in two expressions, one is called Sansara Vriksha, the other is called Brahma Vriksha. When you look at it from the tree that is spreading all over here, then you call it Sansara Vriksha. When you think of the root of this tree, you call it Brahma Vriksha. Both appellations are correct, Sansara Vriksha and Brahma Vriksha. So now we are dealing with Sansara Vriksha. Come. This is called in two expressions. One is called Sansara Vriksha, the other is called Brahma Vriksha. When you look at it from the tree that is spreading all over here, then you call it Sansara Vriksha. When you think of the root of this tree, you call it Brahma Vriksha. Both appellations are correct, Sansara Vriksha and Brahma Vriksha. So now we are dealing with Sansara Vriksha. From the one, the many have come with all the differences. This is called the cosmos today. <coughs> we are caught in this cosmos. We are treated like birds sitting on this mighty tree, making, making out our livelihood, quarreling with people, fighting with people, enjoying dance, singing, everything. The whole tree is a wonderful context of human life. Then, the Gita will say, but this tree you must use to find out what is its root. The tip of the tree must give you an understanding what is the root of this tree. What is behind this tree? What is behind this manifestation? That is the biggest inquiry of the human mind. We can study the tree, how many branches, what type of leaf, flower, etc. That study must lead you to the nature of the seed behind the tree or the root behind the tree. Shankaracharya mentions it. Tula avadhare neva eva mula avadharanam kriyate vikshasya loke In the world, by studying the small leaves of a tree, tip of the tree, we study also the root of the tree. That kind of study you have to undertake. Seeing the effect here, you study the cause. If this is the effect, what is the cause? What is behind it? That is a perpetual human question. And that is what throws out science, philosophy, all these things. What is this world? What is behind it? What is the root of it? That kind of question. In India, this was taken up by very great sages, highly intellectual, most capable people. They have produced a remarkable system of philosophy and mythologies which illustrate this high philosophy. Some of the mythologies are very, very significant from that point of view. And what beautiful imageries come out of it, the Rigvedic imagery developed in the Mundaka Upanishad later on, speaks of a tree on which two birds are there. One, a jiva, the human soul, the other, the ultimate reality, Brahman or the Atman. That's a wonderful example given. Mundaka Upanishad explains it very nicely there. So these are the imageries used to illustrate this teaching. It is very difficult teaching, very difficult to understand, but a little illustration will make it easier. So they brought these imageries of the two birds, etc. And here the whole universe is treated as a tree. Urdhamulam afashyakam ashwatham. This ashwatha which is Urbhamulam and Athashakam, Avyayam, imperishable, immutable, 
It's always there. People come and go, but the tree remains. Leaves come and go, but the tree remains. That kind of thing. Chandam Tiyasya Parnani. These Vedic utterances are the leaves of this tree protecting the tree. It is the leaf that protects the tree, bringing all the energy needed for the tree. Chandam Tiyasya Parnani. Yastam Veda. He who knows this truth, the really he is a Veda with. He is a knower of the Vedas. This is the first word. This is an adaptation of the Katha Upanishad, last chapter. Ashyatha, is there? the same language used there. There is Urdha Mulo Avakshakaha, Esha Ashyatha Sanatanaha, Tadeva Brahma, Tadeva Satsatyam, Tadeva Amrita Muchyade, Tasmin Loga Shuta Sarve, Nadu Nasya Kashana. That is the tree. Roots above, branches below. Urdha Molo Avakshakha. Yesho Ashwatha Sanatana. This is a Sanatana Ashwatha tree. Tadeva Shukram, Tad Brahma. That alone is a pure. That alone is Brahman. Tadeva Amrita Muchyate. That is truly the mortal. Thus then, everything is centered in that particular tree. That's what the Kathopanishad started with in that chapter. Similarly, here also this idea is expressed and now in this tree, in Shankara's commentary on the Kathopanishad, there is a detailed description of the nature of a tree. A tree, as seen, some of the big canyon trees, full of birds on it and enjoying, quarreling, fighting, everything is there. As just the whole world as it were, you can see that. So just imagine the world is like a tree. We are all working here. Here people are dancing and singing. Here they are quarreling, fighting. People are dying. People are born. All that is going on. The whole thing compared to a mighty tree. And we are all in it. Some people want to know, what is the origin of this tree? Where does it come from? Some people, they become philosophers. They become scientists. They try to understand the root. Among such, the great sages of the Upanishads discovered the root of this tree as Brahman, the infinite, the immortal, and from the root has come the whole of this universe. Therefore, the universe also is sacred. Because it has come from the infinite, it is also very holy and sacred. Therefore, we call it Sansara Vriksha and Brahma Vriksha. Both ways we speak of it. That is why the greatness of the world in which we live we understand, after understanding the root of this tree, a seed contains the entire possibilities of a mighty tree. The seed is invisible. Nothing you can see in the seed. But once it develops as a tree, you find myriads of manifestations of branches, twigs, leaves, flower, fruit, etc., etc. So the universe is just the same. From Brahman, the universe has come in a process of evolution and ultimately you find such diversity but don't be frightened behind this diversity there is unity from one the many has come <coughs> and to the one the many will return also in this way the high philosophy developed and to illustrate it they took these examples like the Priksha Alpapiksha or Bodhi or this Ashwatha, etc. <coughs> Next Sunday we shall continue with the same topic. <coughs> we shall spend a minute in silence and then disperse.